Welcome. This is our second social venturing conversation, which is a series of panel discussions on topical themes in social innovation. And today we're focusing on migration, which is one of the, the issues of our time, uh, driven by war, climate change, poverty and other issues. Never seems to be out of the news and political debate um, every time you look at a newspaper or, or your phone. And with forced migration as one of the, the wicked problems in the world today, it's no surprise that social entrepreneurs are working um, to support the people involved. So today we've got a distinguished panel of social entrepreneurs who are working in the field. Um, I'm only going to give them a brief introduction um, because I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and their ventures in due course. Um, so our panel today is uh, Lorraine Charles, who's a social entrepreneur and a researcher and is a, an alum of the Cambridge Social Ventures Incubator Programme. She's also co-founder and executive director of NAMAL, which links forcibly displaced people with remote work opportunities. Um, and she's involved in another of the, uh, a number of other initiatives, such as a, um, a digital solution specialist for FinChurch Aid, a research associate for the Centre for Business Research here at the University of Cambridge, and a member of the MIT REACT Advisory Committee and International Rescue Committee, Technical Advisory Committee for Rebuild, um, uh, their East Africa Livelihood Programme. So that's Lorraine. Uh, we've also got with us uh, Frankie, Frankie Docker. And uh, Frankie is on the Cambridge Social Ventures Incubator Programme at the moment, and is co-founder and CMO of Hey Food is Ready, which is an online marketplace connecting cooks from diverse backgrounds with companies looking for event catering. So um, Frankie helps refugees, immigrants, stay-at-home parents, retirees, and anyone who looks cooking. Uh, to have a platform to share their, their native cuisine and, and connect with a wider community and make some income. Um, and uh, last but not least, we've got Neil Prem. And Neil's a, a long-term friend of the programme. He's a coach, mentor, advisor and author. Um, he's helped uh, many hundreds of change makers from, I was going to say 50 countries, but I now understand it's 70 countries. Um, to um, discover their gift, clarify their message and become thought leaders um, that people want to, to follow. Um, he's worked with many social businesses and ventures supporting migrants. And in fact, Neil and I recently worked together on a, a project to support Ukrainian refugees. Um, so that's our panel. Um, but firstly, let's hear it from hear it from them in their own words. So if we go in the same sequence, Lorraine, perhaps you want to fill in the gaps and explain how you came to be doing what you're doing. Thanks, Mark. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, so NAML was formed for my research. As Mark said, I was a researcher at Cambridge University, and I was doing research to understand the issues that refugees faced in the Middle East where I was living around employment. And this is where I saw the gaps. The gaps were a very narrow view of how organizations viewed employment. They viewed employment as we, we train refugees and they work in Jordan or they work in Turkey or they work in Lebanon. And another gap that I saw was there was no explicit focus on professional skills, soft skills. And we know from education, a lot of employers ask for these soft skills. These are actually often more important than the technical skills. So NAML was formed to fill this gap. We focus on linking refugees who are skilled with remote work opportunities, but we train them in the professional skills, the soft skills with, with partners that train on the technical skills. And I just want to talk about the word namal because everyone always asks what it means. It's an Arabic word. And amal means work and hope in Arabic. So it's a play on words. When we found it, it meant we work, but also amal means hope. And we and I really believe that through work, one gets hope. That's correct, Lorraine. Thanks. Frankie, do you want to tell us a bit more about Hey Food is Ready and yourself? Yeah, absolutely. That's really lovely, by the way, with Lorraine. I thought that was such a wonderful introduction. So, uh, yeah, very inspiring. Um, but, yeah, so um, Mark's already pretty much explained uh, what Hey Food is Ready is. Um, but just to add in a few details, I guess, really what we want to do is connect people through food and also improve the 
representation of those minority food cultures that aren't usually represented in the UK food market. So when you go out onto the street, usually you see lots of different restaurants, lots of chains, that kind of thing. What we want to do is actually bring those cuisines which aren't represented, which are behind closed doors, which are made by those local cooks who can actually cook these wonderful meals but have no platform for it. Uh, so we're the platform that's going to come along um, hopefully um, expand across the UK, who knows? <laughs> um, but hopefully bring um, bring those cuisines to the forefront um, while also working with refugees um, and immigrants to make meaningful income uh, from their food. Yeah. Thanks, Thank Frankie. And Neil, perhaps you could fill in some of the, the gaps from my introduction of you. Yeah, thank you. Well, I've always passionately believed that within every campus and every community, there are people with the talent, uh, passion, creativity and ideas that can solve society's biggest problems. And so what I've tried to do for the last 30 years is find those individuals and give them the space and encouragement to discover what they're really good at, to think through their lived experience so that they they have something to do, something to say, and then to be able to turn that all into impactful careers. Some of those uh, are, are in paid employment, but the vast majority have gone out and set up work because the work that they're really meant to do just doesn't exist and they have to create it. And, and despite, you know, <laughs> my graying hair and 30 years of experience in this, I'm still perpetually excited about the possibilities that I see before me in every community. So thank you. Thanks, Neil. So we, we've touched on some of, some of the, on this, this issue already, but um, I'm interested to know what specific challenges to, that, that the migrants that you work with face. And, uh, you know, what I'm thinking is that sometimes, you know, we think we know, but complex you know but situations are more complex and difficult than 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 we imagine so Lorraine I mean can you tell us a bit about some of the specific challenges that that you know your migrants that you work with face well for employment the challenges seem to be more more plentiful than the you know than the opportunities so I guess when we first started the biggest challenge was well I mean many but for us the biggest challenge was how do we get our talent linked to jobs and how do we socialize jobs to recognize the talent that they aren't used to seeing that have got a different education background that have got a different um you know a, a, a different professional background are qualified to work for their organization and just think we were linking our talent to companies in the global north and for a lot of companies diversity equity and inclusion means hiring someone that looks like me or or yutana but who come from the same universities or the same social networks that they recognize. So what I say to them is real diversity is someone from a different background who doesn't have the same perspectives that we do. And that's what brings in, in increased performance to teams. So that was one of the biggest challenges. I mean, I, I'll, I'll just talk about one more. A lot of refugees live in places unlike you know, unlike unlike what the news will have us think, most refugees are not in Europe. Most refugees are in Lebanon, where Tawana lives, or in Africa, mm. or in Turkey. This is where refugees live. Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda. Europe doesn't have a refugee crisis. In these places, a lot of the challenge, a lot of the things we take for granted, connectivity isn't always easy to come by. A lot of refugees, they might have the skills where they lack devices. And the final challenge I'll talk about is financial inclusion. So many times we get refugees who have the qualifications, who have the skills. They come to me and say, yes, I get this. I have this job. I have this opportunity. I don't have a bank account. How do I get paid from the work that I do? There are solutions. I've, I've got a great news story, which I'll share later on. But there are amazing solutions, which, you know, which, which we've discovered. But, so, but often the challenge is more, you know, it's hard not to let the challenges get you down. And Frankie, same question to you. The 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 the, the people you work with, what 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 challenges do, do they face? That you um, know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think really for me, one of the main challenges that I have found um working with refugees and immigrants is language barriers. I think that that's a huge thing. Um, 
and just communicating to other people and really what we found was was there were that there were just so many so many like sort of blocks up or, or like barriers up in the way of them really connecting with with the wider community and almost being ostracized because of it and I think that's one of the amazing things about food is it can actually be used as a communication medium in a way so I think um, really sort of sharing that enjoying it you know being together even if you can't quite communicate it or you can't quite say it in a very fluent way I think just being there just sharing sharing food and even just sort of engaging in, in that kind of small talk can really help them that's definitely like something which which I noticed and I think um, we hope to alleviate a little bit through through our work um, but it's still very difficult and I think also just alongside that is kind of the education as well I think it's very difficult um, for people to to access that kind of education and that material so again with us what we try to do is we try to provide you know booklets worksheets that that kind of thing um, with classes in person because um, I think again at times that there is that kind of alienation that, that people do experience or people might decide oh actually you know um, I'm, maybe I'm not good enough for this maybe you know the, the society isn't accepting me so I'm just not going to try and I'm, I'm not going to try to get that education but with us what we try to do is, is really um, bring them in you know make them feel comfortable and then hopefully just give them those skills and then those opportunities to be able to showcase those skills um, so yeah, so they, they they can actually really improve themselves and um, hopefully get an education, even in a country which you know they may initially feel like they, they don't belong in. You know, unfortunately, um, but I think I think that is the case for many people. Thanks, Frankie. And Neil, what what do you see as with the ventures you've worked with as the the challenges that that migrants face? I think for me. Um of late the biggest challenge i see is people in the city that i work in which is predominantly cambridge don't have social networks when they arrive here mm. uh, so they're not able to take advantage of the social capital that is embedded within networks and so i've seen that to be one of the biggest barriers what we're doing about that is we recognize that the migrant and refugee communities we're working with often on the other end of the scale have a resilience and determination that I rarely see in local entrepreneurs. So what we try to do is then bring local social entrepreneurs and migrants and refugee would-be entrepreneurs together so that the local entrepreneurs are able to signpost, open up social capital within networks, and the migrants and refugee entrepreneurs are able to infuse that resilience and drive and determination and ability to bootstrap. So we're, tr we're trying to recognize that everyone, whether you're migrant, refugee or native, have limitations. And actually, when we come together as community and recognize we're equal, we're solving each other's challenges and together we're achieving a lot more. That's great. That's interesting, Neil. And this, this issue of kind of partnering, um, is this something that, I mean, how's that, how's that worked for, you know, for you, Lorraine? I mean, in terms of partnerships that you form, because I know that a lot of the work that you do is with corporates. So, you know, how has that, you know, how has that, that um, evolved? So I want to jump on from what Neil said about, about, um, about networks and social capital. And this really describes one of our, one of our really strong partnerships, you know, through, a, through the Cambridge network, thanks to Mark, actually. So we work with Arm, which is a big, which is a big semiconductor company based in Cambridge. And Arm, mentors our talent so we've got a mentoring program which is which is integral to our training program where the where professionals and professionals who work in companies in the global north or, or, or in the global north mentor the talent and this is a this is one where we see them you know we we give our learners access to social capital if we think how we get jobs we never got a job by applying for jobs we get jobs by who we know our networks and a lot of our talent just don't have these networks. They don't have the social capital to help to help them get where they need to be. 
So hence this mentoring program. And this is one of the strong partnerships we have with companies. We want companies to mentor our talent in a way to sort of backdoor way to socialize them into getting to know what our talent is like. And eventually they'll think, oh my goodness, I'm investing so much of my, my team time, or my employees time to mentor these, what, these learners. Surely we should, these are people we need to hire. So through these partnerships, through a mentoring program, we see it as a way to help give our talent access to, to the opportunities which we want them to get access to, which, the, which, is, which would be very difficult for them to have otherwise. And through, the, and through the mentorship relationships, they don't only have access to that one person, they have, they have access to their entire network. And what we've seen is this network has been really instrumental in supporting the talent find jobs, help them through difficult life circumstances. So this sort of incredible social capital is how you know is, is is one of the benefits of our partnerships with different organizations that's really interesting lorraine because uh, you know i think social capital sometimes is something that, that people take for granted and uh when we were waiting for the call to start we were all chatting it's really interesting that everybody's kind of making connections and events they're going to and pe people they people they know and things like that and you, you kind of take that for granted but you know starting completely from scratch without that that network um, must make things very difficult. And what, Frankie, what about uh, Hey Food is Ready in terms of partnerships that you've formed with corporates and other organisations? Uh, yeah, so I mean, that, that's really at the heart of, of the company, really, is, is engaging with the business community as much as possible. Um, so obviously, we, we have our events where we'll, we'll cater for them and we'll have a display of food. And, and through that, we then introduce those new cuisines um, made by refugees um, and migrants to to those businesses so that's that's kind of one way but but i think on a sort of wider scale um i think with with, with our refugee community we've also kind of like used workshops and things like that to introduce them um to build those partnerships with those organizations too um so i think like one of the i think just as like lorraine and everyone has been saying sort of with social capital i think that's been really important for us and one of the main things, obviously starting out, even just well, whether you're an immigrant or refugee, whoever starts on our platform, is that you usually have no, no kind of portfolio behind you. So if you're just starting out with a food business, you have absolutely nothing. So really for us, because we've built partnerships with, with companies like Google, Barclays, Department for International Trade, hopefully Santander soon, um, you know, by building those things, we can then not only get it on our own portfolio, but also get it on their portfolio too. So they can actually say, oh, I catered for this company, I catered for Google, I catered for Barclays. And the kind of like rewarding feeling that they get from that, I think is like, you know, so amazing. And I think that that's really what we're all about as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really about expanding our own portfolio, but also expanding other people's portfolios in the process too. Thanks, Frankie. So one of the issues that I was interested about as well is, is you know, how you identify the, the needs of migrants and tailor your services and support. Because obviously there's, you know, people will have concerns about cultural cultural mismatch or and or, or people being helped, you know, in the way that we think they should be as opposed to what they themselves feel that, feel that they need. Um, and Neil, I mean, how do, you know, how does that work with the programmes that, that, that you've worked on? Thank you. That's that's a great question. I think in the early days, it was really trial and error. You know, we were very guilty of conscious bias, of assuming that we knew best. This is the program you need to go through. And then we began to put it out and we quickly discovered that there were people in the audience who knew 10x more than we did. And that actually they should be teaching us uh, but thankfully, you you and I experienced this, and and we quickly sort of you know began to turn things around. So the way I try to approach it now, and I'm certainly open to help to improve this, is that we often start with with food and fellowship. We want to establish a culture of that we're here to serve. Um, we are not here to dominate. Uh, what is it? that we can do to help you the most. 
And I try to bring together really diverse groups of people. Uh, we eat each other's food, we listen to each other's stories, and then we seek to build those friendships first. And then from that, I find that people are then more willing and open to say, actually, you're doing this workshop on sales and marketing, but really what I would like to do is some help with X, Y, or Z. So, so that's what we're doing for, for better or worse, but I'm, I'm sure Lorraine is, is far more the, the voice of authority on this than I am. So research, I mean, that's where I started doing the research. And, you know, I think trial and error is really important, but before we did anything, we did lots of research. In fact, I was reticent to start an organization until I did the research. I, you know, I, I didn't have my sort of entrepreneurial, I, I, my entrepreneurial sort of mindset grew, grew from you know from doing the organization but I was really much tied to the view that I had to do my research I had to understand the context I had to know everything until I started it but even now we're still learning a lot we still do research but also we have one of our alumni on our board who who we've also hired and whenever we do new things we run it by him he's an Eritrean refugee in Ethiopia we say can you have a look at this what do you think? What's your view? We ask our alumni questions to help us build what, you know, to build our programs because we want to make sure that what we're doing is what's needed. And for me, I'll tell you a little story. Something really touched me recently. I got an email on LinkedIn from a refugee in Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya. And he says, we've got this program. It was literally almost exactly what I've been, you know, what I've been doing. And I thought, oh my God, we're doing the right thing because they're also doing it for themselves. So we need to work with these guys. But the fact that other people are, you know, are doing what we're doing, I think, you know, and refugees are doing this, it means that we're we're onto something. Right, all right. Yeah. No, I'm um, actually sorry, just to follow on from that. Um, I can completely re relate, Lorraine, because we we actually just recently met up with um an organization. Yeah called Picture Eats out in Malaysia and they are doing exactly the same concept as us but out in Malaysia with loads of different businesses like BP or you know um I don't know just, just like you know like Samsung or something really big businesses in similar kind of business model and we managed to meet one of the founders the other day and it's just so nice to kind of have that like you know or someone else is doing the same thing and it's working so no it's great it's really great to kind of come together as businesses as well super yeah Donna, you you uh you volunteered to share your experience of uh, you know being a migrant so please unmute and and tell us your experience thank you yeah so i've been in cambridge for about four years but and it, it was about eight months before the pandemic so I always say that my perspective was very skewed because I actually don't know how the UK was before, um, if it was any different uh, to coming here. But one of the struggles and the challenges I had is also I came and I, I did have a partner, but um, he was not my network. He didn't have a network. So and I I came here, and although I had an extensive experience in in my field in digital marketing, I came here and I really struggled to uh, um, to find a job because one obviously I didn't have a network. But apart from that, from work because I'm now very much established and I have my own agency and I'm I'm doing I'm doing well on a work uh, level. But one of the struggles what I had even before coming here um, was the accessibility of information on anything related to gov.uk, which I found was very much inaccessible. I, even though I read English and I'm very proficient, I found that language and the, it, and the information was very scary and confusing. And until last year, I still made mistakes when I was renewing my visa and I did a wrong application. So one of the first challenges I faced even before coming here was that information accessibility on, on the websites related to anything I need to know as a migrant. Um, and then even when I came here and I went and had an interview, I remember for getting my residence card, 
after that, I felt like kind of left alone. Like I, I didn't know where to go if I had a simple question about like my benefits, not that I get any benefits with my residency, but like, yeah, how can I ask simple questions about, you know, when should I apply for this? When should I renew my residency? How much does it cost? How can I benefit from my NHS and things like that? It's everything that I had to know by myself. And I can imagine if language was a barrier for me, my life would have been really, really hard. Um, so yeah, just that. And, and also until now, four years after living here in Cambridge, I still believe that although I try very hard and because I lead a community here in Cambridge that is dedicated for small businesses here in Cambridge, I still find that integrating into an English or British community and, and that network, un unless it's professional because I work in the field, it's very difficult and I don't even have one single English friend. Uh, all my friends are actually expats. Um, or then when I made friends, even like they all just have their networks. And I found that the culture maybe is a bit closed, um, close to those that are, you know, like coming to Cambridge for work. And, you know, I don't know, I, I, I might live here for all of my life, but I was still perhaps seen as, you know, just uh, an expat. Um, so, yeah, I just I, I will I will stick with those. Uh, that was like the information and yeah actually not having a place to go to to ask those questions maybe there are there but i just wasn't aware of them but thank you for for letting me contribute that's okay i mean that's really interesting as well about that kind of lack of connection and i would say cambridge actually is it is quite a cosmopolitan place because the university and things like that that i don't know maybe i maybe i this is just my you know um if i may i know where you're going with it there is a a huge difference I found that if I came here as a student or as a as a professional mm -hmm. and for us professionals it's really difficult especially that I am self-employed that's even more but that's my own situation but it's a very different situation if you were a gown uh, than being a, a professional in in the city. That's very interesting. In Cambridge they talk about town and gown so uh, yeah that's 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 an, that's an interesting thing. So, so Tana was, was sharing with us some of the barriers and obstacles she's had. What, what about what about you entrepreneurs? About the main barriers and obstacles that 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 you see for your, you know, for your project, for your for your venture. Um, Neil, I mean, what do you see with with the ventures that you work with? Well, I, th I think seed capital is is a massive challenge that that I regularly see. Um, I think isolation as well. I think all too often the people that we're supporting are are working away on the, on their sort of kitchen tabletop on their own, and and that that comes with a price and a, and a, and a toll. Uh, but those would, those would really be the the two things. And then I guess one of the things that that I've noticed with working with displaced Ukrainians of late is many of them struggle with insecure accommodation. You know, they've signed up into the government scheme where they maybe have accommodation for a few months, six months, but they're already aware that maybe the relationships aren't working out. They know it's going to come to an end. So, so that weighs very heavily you know, versus the rest of us who are trying to get our ventures and we have stable housing, we have, you know, we have that level of stability. So those are the things that I, I'm regularly seeing on a daily basis. Building on that, what, what, what are the, how do you track your, your impact and your success? Um, if we move on to, to Lorraine, I mean, Often in social entrepreneurship, we spend a lot of time thinking about impact measurement and things like that, and what counts what counts as success, and you know, uh, you know what matters. So, what, what's your thinking on that? So, I can show you a beautiful report with lots of numbers, but for me, what's more important are the individual stories. So, my favorite story—I mean, I've got many—but this one made me cry. On New Year's Day, I woke up, I got a message on my phone. And we, we'd been running a, a fundraising campaign 
and one of my alumni who works for Meta, he was a Kurdish refugee who recently moved into Ireland, he donated back to the organization. For me, that is the biggest sign of success. We've done something right. If he took, I mean, it doesn't matter how much money, we took the time to give a little back to the organization that, you know, that, I mean, he, he was brilliant before we, before we met him, but he felt that supported him and he likes what we're doing to support others like in him. So for me, this is really the sign of success that people, you know, people who we're helping are recognizing what we do. And I guess another big form, and, and, and for me, another big measure and makes me feel proud is organizations, you know, refugee organizations are coming to us and say, we want to work with you. You know, you know, we see what you do, we follow you. I have so many refugees who, who aren't our alumni, you know, who, who sort of have come across, you know, through trips, through trips to Kenya or through different events who, you know, contact me and say, listen, I really want to work with the organization. I like what you do. So for me, this is the biggest measure of success that we are, you know, we're, we're hearing from the people that we're helping. And then of course, people, people are getting jobs, our talent, you know, we have, a, a, you know, it's, it's employment is tr it's tricky, but you know, our talent are getting jobs. So for me, that's what's important. And Frankie, how do you go about measuring your impact? Yeah, I mean, so very similar, like we, we obviously we have a big sheet of KPIs and all that kind of stuff. Um, but at the same time, I think we're, we're still very early days at the moment. Uh, we were only post rev um, like last November. Um, so we really haven't been going for that long. But I suppose one of the one of the main signs of success, at least for me, has really been seeing that that community grow and develop and the women interacting between uh, one another. I think that's so lovely um, when you start to see that kind of cross cultural interaction. Um, because I think it, it can be so difficult for people to forge those those communities in the first place. And then I don't know to go to an event and we, we had one like, about three weeks ago or something. And you just saw all the women there like talking, smiling, sharing food, that that kind of thing. And I know this is very qualitative and sort of up in the air, but it's, you know, for, for me, it's like it, it's just so it's so lovely to see that. And I, I feel like that is definitely a, a sign of success for us, at least, you know, at this stage, we haven't had any massive you know global nationwide impact but but just sort of seeing that and seeing those you know the, those groups form it's, it's just so so lovely oh, those friendships yeah. yeah i think the qualitative measure is so much more powerful than the, the numbers and kpis like give me a story any day that's far <laughs> more important and far more meaningful than oh look at these beautiful numbers and look at our accounts yeah, absolutely. I, I think like, yeah, and just hearing from people and like their own experiences, I think it's it's so powerful, it's so powerful. So yeah, I totally agree. But you know, positive is also very important, important too, <laughs> not to, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we are doing all that stuff. But yeah, the stories are really kind of at the, at the heart of the business. Yeah, I'd just like to say one word to say, I think both are good. <laughs> you, get, you get quantitative and the quality and the stories and the narratives as well then that's 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 a great thing um that's a great thing um okay looking to the future um what you know what are your future plans for the programs you're involved in and where do you want to see those going um neil what about you with the, the programs you're involved with? oh gosh i was really hoping you were going to go to lorraine first or something because i can if you like <laughs> <laughs> um well if you if you wouldn't mind Go ahead, please. Um, future plans. So we have a few programs which are upcoming later in the year. Um, but what we really want to do is sort of formalize the linking the talent to jobs. And, you know, and, um, and Neil, you spoke about seed funding. So this is one thing that, you know, that we want to get seed funding for. So anyone, anyone out there listening to this, we, you know, we have our proof of concept, but we really need to formalize linking our talent to jobs, but also serve, serve as a portal and ecosystem for other organizations that do training to also help them link their talent to jobs. So create this sort of platform, whatever it is, as an intermediary to sort of help displace talent, because we know that sort of these niche diverse platforms are much more impact, impactful than the sort of big recruitment companies or the, or, the, or, the, or the LinkedIn's. So if we create this ecosystem of displaced talent, talent and talent from the global south, how can we link them to remote work opportunities? So this is what we want to create. That's our big plan. 
are we getting there? It's hard because, you know, uh, you know, an investor said to me, I need an MVP. I'm like, well, I've got an MVP, but it's not, it's, you know, it's not a platform. It's like a, an Excel spreadsheet, but, but, you know, investors are, are so caught up with seeing a tech product. And I think this is why, you know, this is one challenge I have to, you know, I, I have to, to figure out how to overcome because whilst I know we need to have a platform, that's not our product. Our product is the people and what we're doing and the value we bring to companies because companies who can't find talent, we bring diverse talent to companies who need talent, who want diverse talent. So that's our product. We don't have a tech platform, which we can sell for millions of dollars, but this service that we provide is our, it's much more valuable, I see, than a, than a tech platform. And this is our plan, but this is also our challenge. That's great. And by the way, MVP is a minimum, minimum viable product for anybody who's not in the kind of startup business. Uh, and also, this is going to go on YouTube, uh, the recording of this. So if there are any investors out there who uh, want to invest any, in any of these great social entrepreneurs, then um, they're here. So that's great. Frankie, how about you? You've, you've also got a platform, haven't you? Uh, yeah, so we've got a platform. We're trying to develop the tech at the moment, actually, which is quite complicated. <laughs> but yeah, um, actually, it's, it's very similar. It's a very similar problem in a way, because I think we're, we're a marketplace platform. So really, the value of us comes from our community and our network. It's, I mean, anyone, not anyone can build a marketplace, but the marketplace models are already there. Like, it's very easy to replicate. So that's really not where the value comes at all. So it's got to come from those individuals. It's got to come from those communities. Um, so, again, we're facing a pretty similar problem because uh, we're going into investment. Um, well, we're starting conversations actually in, like, a few weeks' time. Um, but we're, like, formally starting in, in kind of September time. That's really when the round will kind of include, I, 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 I suppose. Um, but, yeah, so it, it's difficult kind of communicating exactly where the value is in the business um i think also that kind of social impact side of things as well i think that can definitely be underappreciated um in investment so you know i'm really keen on like kind of putting that in but then a lot of people at times will kind of be you know putting the, the finance numbers forward or you know that that'll really be at the forefront and the tech and all of this when in actual fact like you know the sort of social value I mean, I believe, I, I mean, I'm doing the marketing for the company, so maybe I'm slightly biased, but I believe that, that that's kind of what should be really like pushed forward, because I think that's what people buy into. That's what companies buy into. I mean, like most of our partnerships have been, we've, we've got them through us speaking to people and going, look, there are all these fabulous cooks and telling those stories and persuading them that way. So surely that that is where the value is, but um, but yeah, again, it, it it's very tricky. So so yes, yeah, so we're doing that. Um, also e expansion a little bit. So Newcastle, London, seeing where that goes. Um, but yeah, also kind of consolidating our progress so far because I think that a, another problem is 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 sort of scaling up. I think that that's really difficult, really difficult because you don't want to lose those individuals and that kind of mass crowd and that mass language so it's kind of overcoming that and sort of being able to communicate people's stories authentically without it sort of being this global voice where you're sort of speaking for everybody but actually speaking for nobody in the end um so that's that's quite a big obstacle to scaling up is is so difficult but um but we're getting there and we're just trying to find ways around that and and still like highlighting people and spotlighting uh, those individuals in the process so it's it's really exciting but um yeah definitely a few challenges along the way great thank you neil you've had a chance to think <laughs> it yeah it, it threw me mm. which is the the wonderful power of questions mm -hmm. i think for me I've been spending a lot of time over the last year reviewing where do I personally want to go with this. So Mark, you and I know that when we started 13 years ago, and for those that don't know, Mark and I were involved in a project where we took over a disused bank, put some posters in the window. Hey, if you've got ideas, we're here to help. We had a kettle. We, we had some uh, donuts and we had, we had some people come in and, and out of that grew a lot of stuff. But here we are sort of 13, 14 years later, and we live in quite a sophisticated ecosystem. You know, there are lots of programs, Cambridge Social Workers, I, I still think is one of the best, still recommend everybody to go to it. 
there's online courses and I'm stepping back and going, well, where's the value that I can offer? Because I'm not sure if it's any more in, in that world. And what I'm coming to, and I, and I guess this was where the hesitation was, did I want to publicly say this yet? But why not? We're just with friends. The thing that I'm seeing is that with migrant and refugee uh, entrepreneurs, there's a lack of pastoral support for them. And there's a lack of help around well-being and encouragement. Now, I've, I've been fortunate to spend a lot of time in, in the faith world where we have pastors, where we have people that take care of us. And so I'm raising up the question, how can we take that concept of pastoral support, bring it out the world of religion and bring it into the world of the disadvantaged and the marginalized and offer them the, the care and compassion and mentoring and coaching that is often not accessible. So that's my kind of vision at the moment. Can everyone who's disadvantaged and marginalized be offered the opportunity to have a safe space, a safe space to have, uh, to be listened to, to be cared for and to help them move forward from there. So Lorraine, I'd be really interested to know your perspective if that's just the dumbest thing you've ever heard or whether I should pursue that. No, I mean, we believe in mentoring. Mentoring is a core part of our program. And, you know, and whilst the purpose of the mentoring is for professional development, we recognize that a, that a mentor is someone that has your back. And often, a lot of the talent we work with have never worked with mentors. We actually have to teach them, how do you work, how do you work with mentors? What is this person going to do? You don't know this person. How are they going to help you? And, and often it does evolve into a friendship and this person really supporting. Um, one, one of our mentors is a friend of mine who lives in Dubai. He mentored someone in Afghanistan. So even though the program has finished, he was working with this, you know, with, with this young man and he's helped him get a scholarship to do an MBA. So really supporting him beyond the limits of the program. So I really believe that mentoring is so important. I mean, I have a mentor, I've had several mentors. Mark was one of my mentors. And I really believe that everyone, everyone, everyone should have a mentor, whether you're underprivileged or you're the most privileged person, everyone needs a mentor. And I, I think that's wise words. And um, and it's interesting, I often think with my career that it never occurred to me to have a mentor or that I might need one or how things might have gone differently if I had. Um, so that's that's a that's a really interesting perspective, and what you were saying, Neil. I mean, I think that feels feeds into what Tana was saying about where do you get help and support, and um, you know, it's it's such a difficult issue. Um, I'm mindful that we got about fifteen minutes left, so I, I just wonder if anybody else had got any questions for our panel or any points whilst we're whilst we're here. I, I wasn't really thinking of questions. It was it was very interesting, but just to add on, so this weekend I was actually at Alia Business uh, Center and I was doing a social hackathon and, um, and it was to tackle poverty and equality in Cambridge, right? And one of the main issues was the um, mismatch between skill, skill and matching them with employment. And what you mentioned is that so one of the issues was that the bigger employee uh, employers here actually um, hire towels from outside and, you know, like uh, not even from Cambridge or from certain places, whereas those that perhaps have, you know, great minds and, you know, um, you know, creative and and really motivated don't have the necessarily skills so we came up with an idea of like okay we can run those upskilling programs and so and very quickly uh because I had someone as a mentor on on that uh, kind of small group of people who are interested that turned into starting by building a platform where we 
uh, aggregate all of that is happening in Cambridge. And then we promote the upskilling program. And so, and I was so against what I actually wanted to start with, but I guess because the mentor realized, or the lady who, you know, like actually come from the Alia Business Center, uh, realized that, you know, perhaps what the investors wanted to hear, maybe that's why that was kind of like how she, you know, like almost took a step-by-step step to, eventually end up with starting with an online platform then we 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 pilot the program that we did it and my program that i wanted to pilot is financial literacy and well-being um so yeah i i guess that that now i'm like thinking like because i'm about to start my social enterprise i'm like should i be thinking of a tech product first like um because that was very different from what I wanted to start with, which is an actual program working with people um, and also refugees, because meeting with uh, someone from Chamber of Commerce, they also mentioned that one of the biggest issues refugees uh, are facing here or what they're facing also the council with the refugees is that language barrier and like telling them what to do with their, with their money and how to you know, like how to manage money, how to pay tax, income tax, which is also something completely foreign for anyone coming from the Middle East, I, I believe. Um, we don't have the system of income tax, speci specifically the self-assessment that you need to submit. So I still struggle with that until now. Um, so that was one of the main issues. So yeah, it's just like that tech product that although I work in technology, I still find that for social enterprises it just um i don't know i find it like a bit unfair that everything we need to do now needs to be kind of like starting with that tech product and technology um yes. maybe i can comment because this is one of the pressures that we had at first you need to build a platform and we re we built our program first and we really stuck to our guns we built our program and we use platforms that exist so when we build our, we have our new platform thing, which I call a platform for lack of better words. We're not going to build our own. We're going to do a no code, white label, something. It's going to be something because, you know, like Frankie says, our value isn't the platform. Our value is the community. So the the platform has to be something to facilitate what we're, what we're doing. And this, so everyone's built a platform. So why are we, why are we recreating the wheel? Just use what's out there. Do your research, use those other instead of white, there are lots of stuff you can white label, much cheaper than building your own, much less hassle. Yeah. If you don't mind, I do have a question that I thought of. Uh, you did talk a lot about doing your research way before, you know, you actually started the, the program or what, what it looks like and context. Can you talk a little bit of, I know you studied or, or you've been to Josh Business School, but I don't intend to go into a PhD or master's in that so how what are your tips for doing a research and context for that so that when i start building the program I, it's just kind of like well well researched yeah so i i mean i guess i didn't start with the idea that i was starting a business i started with the idea was i was just curious about this space but for, for other things you know the way i sort of look at it if i have to look retrospectively is i want to understand what the challenges are, the people that I'm trying to help, what what are their pain points and what and, and what solutions are there that already exist and why aren't these solutions serving them? But also have the people that are providing these solutions spoken to the target audience. So just like we said earlier, have we spoken to the refugees? Like what do refugees want? You know, some sort of, you know, ethnographic or some sort of qualitative research to understand what they want and and you know just speak to them speak to people it's just some, you know go, go to the communities what do they want and I think sometimes you have to speak to a lot of people because but speak speaking to a lot to, to just a few you might get a sort of obviously you know research a skewed view speak to as many as possible and many sort of different 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 skills different levels of education, different ethnic groups, different language abilities. Um, but also in terms of employment, see what the see what the market needs. Because you spoke about this job skills mismatch. What we have to do is not start with what the people want to do, but we start with what the companies want. Because if we want to place people in jobs, what do they want? And that's the most important thing. 
So sometimes you have to work backwards and say, okay, what do the companies want? And, and then say to the talent pool, this is what companies want. Which of these are you interested in? Because there's no point giving them an education in something which won't give them a job. I think I think there's a really interesting point there, actually, as well, which is the, the this kind of um, contrast with outright tech entrepreneurship, where you know the Facebook say you know move fast and break things. Well, you know, hang about. We're talking about vulnerable people here in difficult circumstances, so perhaps we do need to apply a bit of thought and consideration to things before we just kind of wade in with a, a move fast and break it approach. Um, okay, I'm mindful of the time. We've got about seven minutes left. So um, our panel of entrepreneurs, maybe you could give your top thought, recommendation, encouragement to future social entrepreneurs. So it's interesting the question from Tana. You know, what would you, you know, what would you say to somebody who now is considering to be becoming a social entrepreneur and perhaps working in this field? Um, Neil, do you want to go first? Thank you. Wow, that's a really big question. I think the first thing I would say to any person that's, that's thinking of becoming a social entrepreneur is, is, to, is to believe that you can do it. The second thing I would want any would-be social entrepreneur to know is, look, Let's start with a self audit. You have profound gifts, you have talents, you have abilities, you have knowledge, you have skills, you have life experience, all of which are like pieces of a beautiful jigsaw puzzle or ingredients that, that make a, a fantastic cake. So let's, let's start with that. Then let's begin to come up with 101 ideas as to how you can bring those gifts and talents to the world. Um, and as, as you and I, Mark, have often said, you know, we need 101 stupid ideas before we find one potentially viable. So that would be the second thing I would say is let your imagination run riot. Inevitably, you have an idea on day one, and all the evidence says that idea will probably not come to fruition. So go very broad. Um, and then the third thing I would say is um, build in partnership with the people that you want to serve. Get out, talk with them, find out their biggest challenges, define the problem that you want to solve. And I suppose the thing that I'm most well known for is encouraging people to start where they are, use what they have and do what they can. You know, don't despise that small beginning. Be faithful in the little, and eventually you'll be rewarded with lots. So that's my humble advice. That's great, Neil. Thank, thanks. Lorraine? Um, don't be afraid to cry, because I can't tell you the number of times that I've cried and think, what am I doing? I just need a job. This is too painful, too hard. Why am I doing this? So don't be afraid to cry. Don't be afraid to reach out to people that you don't know. Talk to everyone. Talk to complete strangers. Talk to any. Tell everyone what you're doing. My comms, my com, one of my board members is comms expert. She says, you are the best comms for your organization. You tell everyone what you're doing at every opportunity. Because often people who seem to have literally no, no intersection with what you do can be the biggest connector for you. So tell everyone what you do because you never know who you meet at the bus stop. I met someone in a, in a queue somewhere that was like, oh my gosh, we have a connection and, you know, and, and it worked. Talk to everyone all the time. And I guess my third thing is, you know, be kind to yourself because I work all the time. And sometimes I have to think, okay, I have to stop now because I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm up at midnight falling asleep on my laptop. And my, and my kids are sort of, who knows if they're awake or if they're asleep. But, you know, remember... You know, remember, you know, remember to look after yourself, and and I and I say it knowing that I don't do it enough. But you know, I'm going to go to I'm going to go to the gym after this this meeting. But really, take time to do something for yourself. It's not an easy journey. It's hard. It's not going to be easy. 
it's hard, it's painful, it's filled with tears and laughter. But when you get those moments of and something works out, you feel like on top of the world, like nothing can bring you down. So the, the moments of exhilaration are incredible. And then the moments of defeat are equally incredible and you feel crushed, but you always know that something good is going to happen next. That's great. Thanks, Lorraine. Frankie. Um, yeah, those are all really amazing points. Uh, I totally agree with all that. Um, just to kind of add on to that, I guess, at the end, um, for me, one of the main things that I found probably the most difficult just starting out was actually just getting in the routine of being an entrepreneur. Um, because I think this is something that people really overlook. You sort of like go on this thing and you're like, you know, I really want to do this. I'm so passionate about this. And then it's like, you've got to get up every single day. And you've got to say, right, I'm still going to do this project. I'm going to do this project on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and think about it on the weekends or even do it on the weekends, you know? Um, and I think it's actually getting in that mindset that you're actually doing that. And I think that's one reason, uh, I mean, at least from what I've seen, is why, why people give up is because they lose that pattern. They get out of the rhythm of doing something. They go one day, oh, you know what? I'm, I don't really feel like it today. I don't really feel like it today. And then they give up and then they go the next day, they get up a bit late, then they go, oh, I don't feel like it today either. I'll just leave it to another day. And the problem is, is as soon as you start to do that, then you just you lose the business so I think for us it's been really important just trying to keep some kind of routine going which I know sounds a bit weird because I think as an entrepreneur you so like the lifestyle is generally sort of perceived as being sort of like you know you do this you do that you're sort of all over the place but in actual fact I think having some kind of kind of routine some kind of schedule to it all is actually really helpful it doesn't have to be like very strict it doesn't have to be restrictive because I think you've got to have some leeway for that kind of imagination and that sort of innovative spirit if you like but at the same time I think you do have to have that kind of underlying structure just to keep you in place and then you get because like I've been working now for for literally two years on, on my project so it's kind of been a continual process of getting up every day and being like you know I'm going to work on this um and that that's something which I think for those people just starting out you you've got to kind of get, get into your heads uh with doing but yeah yeah as, as far as just, just being an entrepreneur I, I I think that's really important um but yeah I'd, I'd also really agree um with like just speaking to people um because I think social it's all part of the word social entrepreneur you've got to get out there um and yeah no we actually some of our so some of our first people that we got on board was literally just through speaking to uber drivers so we'd go an Uber, you're and I, and then we'd just be speaking to them, talk to them about their culture, and then like they'd be like, Oh, I do booking, blah blah blah. And then, like, you know, we then get them on the platform, get them on a call after that. So it's just really surprising, like, who you can meet. Um, and just yeah, say your idea to everyone. Um, I know it's already been said, but uh, but yeah, say your idea to everybody. Um, because yeah, you, you you never know who'll come along. I think that's something which is just so special about about being an entrepreneur, is you never know what will happen the next day. So yeah, that's my that's my advice. Thanks, Frank. That's great. That's great. I'm gonna I'm gonna save that for future use. Um, so thanks everybody. Um, thanks so much to our panel, Lorraine, Frankie, and Neil. Thanks to our attendees. That was our our second social venturing conversation, and uh, Pam and I will be putting together a, another one for probably a couple of months' time. So watch this space, and. Um, Take care. Thank you.